You know, I've mentioned before, you know, from the time I was very young, I, I had a strong desire to be a doctor, to heal people. Other people's sufferings touched me deeply, and having this kind of natural impetus to want to relieve suffering. And I thought this was what the good Lord wanted me to do, and so I went about my life trying to accomplish it. And so in, in school, especially in, in high school, I was all about math and science. I couldn't get enough of it. And uh, on the other hand, I hated English. And I, and I couldn't write very well. And I think my uh, high school English teachers would be surprised that now I regularly publish. That's, not, that's a skill I learned later on. But it was only later in my, in my late teens and early years at Notre Dame when that desire to be, began to be clarified, not a healer of the body, but of a healer of the soul as a priest. And I, you know, I spent time struggling to embrace that clarification. Now to heal, a doctor must learn about sickness in a way what, it, what attacks, corrupts, harms, and defiles the human body. And again, I loved discovering the causes of things. You know, good medicine requires good diagnosis. And a proper diagnosis is key to curing the illness. Because if I don't get the, the diagnosis correct, I don't know how to heal. And so if we were suffering symptoms that may indicate a serious illness, we would care, right? We'd want to get to the bottom of it, wouldn't we? We'd, we'd search the internet. We'd go to a doctor, we'd go to a specialist, we'd go to another specialist. We'd keep going in, to different specialists until we found a pathway of healing. And one of the dimensions of the priesthood is sharing in Jesus' power as the divine physician, the healing of our souls, which, is, which are much more precious. You know, if something was attacking, harming, corrupting, defiling, our souls, we would want to get to the bottom of it, right? Now today Jesus draws our attention to the human heart in his confrontation with the Pharisees. And as the divine physician, he teaches us about what defiles it. And remembering the heart in the Bible is much more than how we understand it now because we usually think of heart as the place of our emotions. Right? But in the Bible, in the biblical mind, the heart is much deeper. The heart is the center of the person. It's where we think, where we decide, where we love. In other, in other words, it's the biblical way of indicating the soul. And the human soul is the, the invisible dimension of our nature that makes our bodies be alive. You know, if, we, if we look at the Latin word for soul, anima, the soul is what animates us and what provides us with life. It's what distinguishes a living human being from a dead corpse. And, and this is the beautiful thing is that the human soul is given at the moment of conception directly by God. God alone gives us our soul. Now, our, our dad and mom, they co-create with God in giving us our bodies. But at the moment of that, of that conception, it is the Lord himself that gives us our soul. Our soul is what most images God in our being and what perdures after death, right, in the separation of the body and soul. The human soul is the masterwork of God in the created realm. He made our souls to be alive and beautiful to to be resplendent, to be reflective of his own life. Made our, made our souls to be like him. And he gave us a rational soul that, so that we could know him and love him and serve him and to love him and through him to love our neighbor and everything he created. And so today our, our blessed Lord is engaging the Pharisees and scribes about what defiles the human soul. It's a good topic because we should be intensely interested in whatever would defile this great masterwork of God. 
And he corrects them because they are wrong about what defiles the human heart and how. And this would have come as a shock to his listeners. The Pharisees and scribes were considered extraordinarily religious people. They went to synagogue every Saturday. They prayed at least three times a day. They used to walk to Jerusalem each year to celebrate the major Jewish feasts. They washed before every meal. They fasted routinely. They ate only kosher meat. They wore special clothes. They gave 10% of their income to the temple. And yet in all of this, Jesus says, this people pays me lip service, but their heart is far from me. And he was right. These people who did all of these religious practices were also the ones who ended up conspiring to kill Jesus. Their hearts were indeed far from him. So what defiles the human heart? Our Lord himself today at the end of this passage defines it. Sin. That which harms and can even kill the soul. And sin means turning away from God in some fashion. I sin when I know something is evil and I freely commit that evil act. Now there's really some really good news in this. The first good news is that other things do not defile me. Things like my life circumstances and the sins of others. Right? This comes as a great piece of good news for those who have been abused. Even though sometimes their sins make, make one feel defiled, Objectively, Jesus says, that is not your defilement. And from Scripture, especially in the first letter of John in chapter 5, verse 17, we see two types of sin that are indicated, one that is deadly and one that is not deadly. And if you remember your catechism, you know what that, that distinction is, right? We call that venial sin and mortal sin. Venial sin weakens our relationship with God, and mortal sin actually severs it. If we commit mortal sin and we do not repent or seek forgiveness and then we die, that separation from God becomes something permanent and eternal. And this is what we call hell. What is clear from our Lord is that sin comes from within ourselves our souls, our hearts, in turning away from God. And at the origin of all sin is pride, right? When we repeat the pattern of the original sin in making ourselves into God, that I know better than God, I will decide what is good and what is bad for myself and to turn away from the true God. Another way of understanding sin is that it is an act of anti-love, Love is to give of oneself, of doing good for the other. And sin is selfish in some way. It erodes our true human nature. Sin is something that is anti-human as well. And the further good news here is that our Savior does not want anyone to be lost. He does not want this defilement in us. He does not want one drop of his precious blood to be shed in vain. And so he teaches us about this. And even more, he becomes one of us. And he takes the weight of all sin upon himself. And he suffers and dies for us in order to save us and to heal us from this defilement. And so how do we know what sin is? How are we going to make a proper diagnosis of our soul? What's the diagnostic process here? How are we going to understand the cause? Well, the first thing is that we need to listen. We need to listen. That means silence and prayer. Listening to open up our soul and to yield the center of ourselves to the Lord, which is his rightful place, so that he can go to work. This is the mystery of our, of our being created in God's image and likeness. The center, center of ourselves is not supposed to be ourselves. The center of our soul 
is for the Lord. And there, when he is at the center, then we find our true selves. And so in that listening, we listen to God who gives us his law. Another way of thinking about his law is that he's, he's showing us what his life is like. He's showing us how to live his life, how to be like him, and to live in proper relationship with him and with each other. His law is our diagnostic tool in discovering what defiles us. And often we, we have a negative connotation to law, right, to rules that somehow limits my freedom. But this isn't true because good law points to the good that we must do and ensures that those who insist on doing evil actions which harm themselves and others are not allowed to have the upper hand. We had a little bit of an experience with this last year in our own city. What happens when law is disregarded? People are harmed. Property is damaged. Chaos ensues. Our life together as a community begins to unravel. A once beautiful city is trashed. Right? The rule of law keeps out the rule of the domination of the strongest over the weak. And so how does, law, how does God give us his law? Where are we to listen? Well, first he gives us what's called the natural law. This is the law that he wrote in the order of creation. And anyone who thinks a proper use of our, of our rational capacity, we can discover this law, even before faith. Examples of the natural law are don't murder, don't lie, marriage between one man and one woman. And the Lord went further in what we call revealed law. That is, that he gave us his law. He spoke to us in history, right? First to Moses, and then he himself came and gave us the new law. So we find the, the revealed law is what we find in the Bible. The law of the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, and the law of the new covenant. Love one another as I have loved you. And since God is the author of both the natural and the revealed law, they are harmonious. They fit together. The natural law is taken up into the revealed law, and the old law is taken up and fulfilled in the new law that's given to us in Jesus. And so with this in mind, we can understand why Moses would exclaim in joy, what great nation has statutes and decrees that are as just as this whole law? which I am setting before you today. The chosen people, at least at the beginning, treasured the law, treasured the commandments. They loved them, looked at them as one of God's greatest gifts and as the pathway to life. God's commandments are not fences to hem us in, but signposts pointing the way to true and lasting happiness. They constitute the parameters of the saving relationship, the covenant with the Lord. And so breaking the commandments isn't simply breaking a rule, but it's breaking and harming a relationship and brings about the defilement of God's great masterwork that is ourselves, our souls. You know, another way of looking at it is through the wit of G.K. Chesterton. He once wrote, no man can ever break any of the Ten Commandments. He can only break himself against them. No man can ever break any of the Ten Commandments. He can only break himself against them. And so Jesus fulfilled and perfected the natural law and the law of the Old Covenant in the new law. Love one another as I have loved you. And this ultimate commandment has taken shape in the teaching of his bride, the church, who is in this one flesh union with, his bri with her bridegroom in the Eucharist. And so the magisterial teachings of the church are not add-ons to what Jesus has told us. Right? He told the apostles at the Last Supper, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so the magisterial teaching of the truth is not an add-on, but it's the unfolding 
of what Jesus has revealed to us in the new law. It's the unfolding of what he revealed to show us what it means to, what it means to say, love one another as I have loved you. Like in the clarification or the teaching of the immorality of artificial contraception or the presumption of giving nutrition and hydration to a sick or dying patient so long as they can benefit from it. And so knowing all of this, what's our task? Right? St. James tells us today, be doers of the word and not simply hearers. Well, I would, I would, I would suggest to be interested in what defiles us, to open the soul and be willing to listen to the Lord speaking his law to us. Diagnose the defilement. Not in self-hatred, that's a trick of the enemy to get us discouraged, but in order to be healed. And in fact, diagnosing what defiles our soul is a cause for rejoicing because it already means we're on the path to freedom. You know, we're weak and we're sinners and we fall short. And so what, the real concrete way that we diagnose is we do what's called an examination of conscience. You know, in the back of church, we have that trifold, that, that brochure that has a beautiful series of questions that we can ask ourselves in the depths of our soul to help to diagnose what it is that, that is harming my relationship with the Lord. And, and in a way, the examination of conscience is like specifying the law as it applies to my own heart. And then we can do that, hopefully, daily. And to be aware of our root sins, our habitual vices, right? And we can, if we do this each day, we, the, tra the tradition of the church is like we do it in the evening before we go to bed at night. And to conclude with an act of contrition, so as we go to sleep, that we have that, that, that repentance going, right, be, with the Lord about our, about our wrongdoing. And this also is our remote preparation for confession, so that when I go to confess, I'm all ready to go. And then it doesn't feel so overwhelming or so, or so impossible. Right? And then I want to confess. Right? If, I, if I'm in mortal sin, I want to go to confession as soon as possible. But if I'm not aware of mortal sin, a good habit to be in is a monthly confession. If we're really looking for spiritual growth, we want to practice a monthly confession. And then from there, to engage. Engage in the good works, like St. James tells us. You know, we have our, our picnic and ministry fair coming up where we have an opportunity to sign up for all the ways that we can be involved in this parish and in the mission of this parish. And this fall, we're having two big initiatives to take part in. In September, we're going to do a series about the basic gospel message, the kerygma that will culminate in a ret parish retreat on a Saturday. Uh, and then after that, we're going to go into to the Be Healed book and, and a series of sermons on that and to be able to go participate in that in small groups. And that too will culminate in a healing retreat. So here's all these ways that we can be doers of the word as a lover. And that's really the heart of the matter, isn't it? to follow Jesus as a lover. He did not create us to be defiled, but to be resplendent with his life. And so let's have the courage to diagnose, the courage to discover the cause of what weakens or severs our union with him, to understand those causes that, that lead to a greater joy, a greater freedom, greater authenticity, greater love and holiness, the cure. And then we go to our merciful Savior who already loves us so completely to receive from him healing for our souls so that we, who are the masterworks of God's creation, can shine brilliantly with his life.